Testing. All right, welcome to CS 4510. This is lecture 06A, and this is on what's called pushdown automata. Pushdown automata. So um, essentially, let's talk about the limitation of DFAs. Last time we talked about context free grammars. Uh, the time after that, we talked about syntactic structures. We talked about an application of an attempt to make linguistics a science. Um, let's go back to the DFA and revisit its limitations. You can think of a DFA as that state diagram of ours. You can also think of it as the magic box. And uh, it has access to the input in some way, but in, it can only move right uh, and read only this input. It only has access to this. It doesn't have any like RAM or anything useful. It can only do, um, that's basically all it's limited to. Um, so we tried to generalize the DFA and we ended up with an NFA and then that was not that much more powerful. It had access to non-determinism and it can do some weird things but not enough weird things to make it more powerful. So let's just take the direct uh, definition of, a, of an NFA in fact and let's give it a data structure. So recall one of the best context-free grammars that we, uh, the language, context-free languages that we had. This generated uh, the Dick language of balanced parentheses. Um, do you guys remember to decide a string of balanced parentheses what uh, data structure you had to use? Like if in your uh, maybe 1332 class you Right, something like this. When you ever probably had to do some assignment with arithmetic expressions like a plus b, a times b, something like this. Do you remember what data structure you had to use for that? It was like a stack. It was a stack. Yeah. So that's all we're going to do is we're going to uh, a PDA, which is a push down automata. I guess conventionally it doesn't have to be pushed down, but we call it that. A push down automata is just uh, an NFA and a stack. That's all it is. So we're going to give a NFA a stack. That's all a PDA is. It's going to have the ability to have a memory structure that it can read and write to. And in terms of a stack, that's just going to be pushing and popping. So it's going to be able to push certain symbols and pop certain symbols. So we're going to modify the transition function of an NFA in such a way that it has access to a memory structure. So what we'll say is a, a, a PDA is defined as a tuple a Q, sigma, those you may know, gamma, a new alphabet, uh, Q0, you may know, delta, you may know. We'll talk about exactly how delta looks, uh, and F. And uh, all these parts, some of them are similar to an NFA. So Q is Q0 to QK is some finite set of states. Uh, Sigma is the input alphabet. And then gamma is what is called the stack alphabet. Both of these are finite. And both of them are, are finite sets of symbols. Conventionally, we will have the stack alphabet just be the input alphabet and the special symbol with, called the stack canary, which is a dollar sign. We'll talk about why that's necessary. Now, we have two alphabets. They can be anything. Technically, they could be anything anything interesting, but usefully, we'll make just the stack alphabet be the input alphabet. Be the input alphabet. To give you a picture of a PDA uh, before we finish defining this would be like we have a stack here, and it grows unboundedly down, and somehow the computer has access to its input still, where it moves right and reads only. But here, it can uh, it has access to the stack. And this, it can push and pop to it. So this is, uh, it has access to one additional auxiliary data structure that it can now write to. So you can keep track technically of something slightly more arbitrary than the just uh, the states. The, and recall an interface finitely many states, you can remember exactly one thing at a time, or finitely many things at a time at least. But now you can keep track, you can write some stuff down. Um, 
the stack alphabet is the set of symbols that you write, you push and pop to the stack. The sigma is the input alphabet. It's the things that go in the input. Conventionally, they're almost the same, except for this special symbol. Uh, Q0 is simply the designated start state. Uh, delta. Now, how are we going to define the transition function? Uh, let's recall how we wrote, write, wrote the transition function for several other automata. For a DFA, we took um, a single state, we read a symbol off the input, and we moved to a new state, right? For an NFA, we uh, read a symbol, uh, began at a state, uh, optionally read a symbol, so sigma union epsilon allowed us to have epsilon transitions, and then we moved to a set of states. So we went to the power set of, of Q, right? We want uh, the transition function of a pushdown automaton to be of the form, it's going to move from state to state, and as it does so, it's going to be able to read the input, it's going to be, it's going to be able to push and pop to the stack, but we also want it to optionally be able to do that. So the way we'll write this is we'll say, begin at some state, read the input, so sigma union uh, the empty string, epsilon. So that basically means optionally read the input, uh, and then pop from the stack, and push to the stack, and change states. Right? What this means is this is a state, this is read input. Oh, this is the state, this means read input. This part up here, this means pop, stack, and this is push, and this is state. Right? When we draw the state diagram, this is a of course, over explaining, way too complicated. You're never going to actually look at the formal definition when you draw a PDA. What you're going to do is look at the look at the stack like this. You're going to have a transition on it. It's going to be written this way. There's going to be three symbols on the transition of a PDA. And it's going to mean read A. It's going to mean pop B and push C. We'll get some more into exactly how to write the transitions. And A and B and C can all be epsilon, right? But basically, read a symbol, pop a symbol, push a symbol in a single transition. Uh, one thing left, F is just a selection of uh, final states. We, the PDA is non-deterministic because it maps to a set of states. Uh, we generalize the NFA. Not the DFA, because it turns out that the deterministic PDA is actually not equivalent to the PDA. So we want to have non-determinism for our power. Um, right, so this is just the formal definition of what a PDA is, but like anything else, you're going to have to uh, just give the state diagram. Like when you ask you to draw a DFA, you just draw the little picture. Same thing for a PDA, and the, today's lecture is just going to be spent on just drawing these little pictures. Um, any questions so far? As we define more and more powerful automatons, uh, you're going to be able to bring in more and more programming intuition into uh, the construction of these until it's basically looking like code. So being good at coding maybe doesn't make you good at writing DFAs, but being good at coding will make you at least better at writing uh, PDAs, because PDA is closer to an algorithm than a DFA is, certainly. It's more powerful. Obviously, it has this auxiliary memory structure. We'll compare PDAs and DFAs later. Um, but let's just give some programming analogies that we can of the following transitions. Uh, suppose you have epsilon, read nothing at the input, pop nothing, push nothing. If you see a transition like this, what does this really do for you? What does this do if you see this in a PDA? Again, read A, pop B, push C is what A, comma B, arrow C means. What does epsilon, comma, epsilon, push epsilon mean? Yeah. Epsilon transition, it does nothing. Yeah, this basically just changes the state. Because the stack is, nothing is pushed to the stack and nothing is popped from the stack, the stack does not change. 
And in fact, the input does not change either. So this is exactly like an epsilon transition in an NFA. What about, um, we suppose we have a transition that looks like this. We say read an A, uh, epsilon A, read a B, epsilon B. If you see this transition, what does that do? Yeah. This transition, all it's conditional. All three have to be taken. This means read an A, pop nothing, push an A. So what this means is, once you see an A on the input, push it to the stack. If I read an A off the input, push it to the stack. If I B read a B off the input, push it to the stack. Now, if this were in a self loop of some kind, what it would mean is read the input and dump it to the stack. right? What about if we did something like, um, Something like that. What would that be? Yeah? No input, pop the last thing from the stack. Yeah. This is just literally uh, pop. It, and it, don't even read it. You know? Now, the state you transition to, you can say, if I pop an A, I go here. If I pop a B, I go here. But this, these two being on the same arrow basically means pop and ignore it. Just dump, throw it off the stack. And in fact, were you to put this on a selfie, <coughs> it would empty the stack. It would dump the entire contents of the stack out. right? Um, what about uh, epsilon b b? What does that do? It's like kind of like a peak. Exactly. This is like a peak, peak operation. Now, unfortunately, the only way to read the stack is to pop from it. So, how do you peak at the top of the stack non-destructively? Unfortunately, you technically destroy it. You pop b, and you're like, great, I popped the b. Let me push the b right back. So this would change the state you're going to if the top of the stack was a certain thing. So this is like if top of stack is B, do this. That's essentially what this thing is. We can bring in some pretty good programming analogies when we define our, 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 our uh, PDAs, even though they're not deterministic. So let's define, um, let's give a PDA just immediately. We give a PDA for some useful languages, A to the N, B to the N. Uh, N is a natural number. This one is, of course, just the warm up in the example. What we're going to do is every PDA is basically going to look like this. The first thing you're going to do in a PDA is we don't have the ability to test if the stack is empty. So what we do is we use a special symbol to denote that. We denote that the stack is empty by reading nothing, popping nothing, and then pushing this dollar sign. What that means is the stack currently has a dollar sign in it. We don't use the dollar sign anywhere else. If we ever read the dollar sign, we know that it's like calling is empty. You know. Um, before we get into designing this PDA more thoroughly, suppose I asked you for an algorithm that uses a stack to determine this language. How would you do it? With code, yeah. However many A's you have, pop them, and then see if you're at the end of the stack. Yeah. Push the A's to the stack. While you're reading the B's, match each red B to a popped A, and then accept only if the number of A's is exactly the number of B's. So what we're going to do is first push the stack canary to make sure that we know when the stack is empty or not. Because as defined, there's no way for us to just call like an isEmpty function. Then what we're going to do is every time we see an A on the input, we're going to pop nothing and push the A. Now, when do we stop pushing A's? When we stop reading A's, when it's a B. When it's a B. So if the input is a B, we're going to stop pu pushing A's, and we're going to pop an A. Now, B comma A arrow epsilon means read a B off the input and pop an A off the stack. We'll go through an execution slowly on this, on this machine. Then when we're there, we want to match the remaining Bs in the input to the remaining As that are in the stack. So this is going to be read a B off the input, pop an A off the stack, and push nothing. Now we want to accept only when the stack is empty. If the stack is not empty, there's been a mismatch with the number of As and Bs, right? So we'll say uh, read nothing off the input, pop the canary, and push epsilon. Right? 
R pushing the canary at the beginning is easy because you just push it. There's, you haven't done anything yet. Popping the canary, the epsilon here means that it can be taken without reading the input, but it can also be taken after the input is finished. So if you can read, if the top of the stack is uh, a dollar sign, you can take this transition. But if you still have input left to read, you'll implicitly reject from there. Let's go, through the, let's go through the computation of this specific PDA on three words. We'll first do the computation on uh, A, A, B, B, okay? So we'll begin in this configuration, and we'll say the stack is empty, and we're currently looking at the letter A, okay? A configuration in general for other automaton is a, simply a snapshot of the execution of the machine at that very moment. When you go to a VM and you click snapshot, it like saves the entire copy of the RAM to a file, right? Basically, a, a configuration of a PDA is simply a description of the, instant of, of, of the PDA at some instant in a computation. But we begin with an empty stack, and notice it's pushing down, so it's unbounded in that way. Now what we're going to do is read the A. We're not going to read anything, but we're going to simply push the canary. So after one computation step, we'll be here, A, A, B, B. A is still being looked at. We have not read it yet. And the stack now contains a dollar sign. Right? We're going to see this read A. Uh, if we're, we're now at this state, what transitions we can take? We can't take that one because we, we don't see a B. But we can take this one. So we see read an A, pop nothing, push an A. So we read that A. And not only do we read the A, we pushed an A to the stack. You agree? The stack now contains A dollar sign. This, the dollar sign is buried deep into the stack. We can't actually read that. We can only read the top of the stack. Now, I see another A, and I'm going to just push it to the stack. OK? I'm at this state. I see a B in the input, and there's an A in the top of the stack. So I'm going to choose to take this transition. So I'm going to pop the A and read the B. Those are going to be matched together. Now again, I have an A, I have a B in the input and an A on the top of the stack. So I'm going to pop the A and read the B. Pop the A and read the B and pop the A. I'm going to take this transition once. There's no more input left to read. Once I have no more input left to read, I can only take transitions that read epsilon, because I can't read anything else. So there's only one transition left. I'll take this one, and I'll pop the uh, canary, and I'll accept. So we see that this PDA does accept AABB. By the way, there's a bug in this PDA. What is it? Just remembered. This is we want to make a PDA for A to the N, B to the N, but there's a small issue actually. You don't accept nothing. Like you don't accept epsilon. The empty string, yeah. How do we fix that? Yeah. Now it's good. Right. The empty string is now accepted by the PDA. Is implicit rejection now like any situation where like either of the conditionals don't match? There we go. Okay. Um, yeah, let's do it. Let's consider, uh, let's consider the computation of two strings. Let's consider a to the n, b to the n plus 1. Okay? Consider that computation. You're going to push the a's, pop the b's. The stack is the, the, you're going to be, uh, b is going to be the, in the input, and you're going to have a dollar sign left. Right? So you're at this state. Uh, what are, it's not deterministic, so consider all possible computations you can take. There's one B left in the input, and there's a dollar sign at the top of the stack. You can't take this transition because there's no A to pop from the stack anymore. You could take this transition. So the, what that'll give you is you don't read the A, but now the stack is empty, and you've reached this state. 
A PDA only accepts if the entire input has been finished reading. You still have to read the B. So what that means is from here, you implicitly reject. Right? So a string of A to the N, B to the N plus 1 will reject on this PDA. That's the way the implicit rejection falls. Yeah? Do we still accept if our stack isn't empty when we reject? Yeah. So it turns out usefully you will want to accept when the stack is empty. But you're technically allowed to accept before the stack is empty. The stack does not need to be empty in order to accept. However, usefully, um, like we wanted to use the stack to make sure the exact number of A's was exactly the number of B's. Um, if you don't accept when the stack is empty, it may mean that you could have done that with a DFA or something else to begin with, or you're bad at programming. Usefully, the stack should be empty. We, most problems that we'll solve are, are testing something that requires testing the stack to be empty, something like this. So technically, no, but it's the same reason that, the, that gamma doesn't need to necessarily be sigma and the canary. It can be anything. Usefully, it's a certain thing, you know. Um, let's do the computation of this, of this uh, NFA on one more word. Let's do it on uh, A to the N plus 1, B to the N. So what we're going to do is we're going to read the A plus 1, uh, the N plus 1 A's in there. We're going to push them to the stack. Then we're going to pop all of them off. We're going to be left with no input, but we're going to have a single A on the stack still that's not matched, right? So we're going to pop the Bs, and we're going to match them, but then we're going to be here. We have an A on the top of the stack and no input left. We can't take this tr transition because the top of the stack is not a dollar sign. We can't take this transition because the, there's no input left to read. So unfortunately, this is also an implicit reject. But it's an implicit reject from a different state, but it's still an implicit reject, right? You can also imagine any string that has an A that comes after a B would also be an implicit reject. So you can see that this PDA exactly and only decides strings of the form A to the N, B to the N. Right. Any questions on this specific PDA? So when you said that you technically, like for, by the definition, don't have to accept when the stack is empty, like basically in uh, like an NFA we had that you basically implicitly reject on all cases except where the only thing left to read is the empty string at the end of the yeah. thing. Because right? then it would be silly to implicitly reject, you implicitly reject everything no matter what. And so like in this case, technically that's the same thing, and we manually ensure that the stack is empty by using the stack canary. Yeah. What you could technically do in a PDA is finish reading the input and then go through some number of transitions that read and write to the stack. But eventually, you can't do that forever. A PDA does not get into some infinite loop. It, it, it will halt. Right? All computations of the PDA terminate. Question? Good. Yeah, certainly. Try to come up. You finish reading the input, you're only allowed to take epsilon transitions from there. It's like saying, if I add this, does it, does it do anything? The answer is no. Is that a non-halting computation? I disagree. Consider that you can only, there's only finally many states for you to go to at that point. You can read and write to the, the stack, you can only do a few things, and then you're done. You're only allowed to do a minor amount of post-processing after you finish reading the input. I mean, you could get yourself into a loop, right? Uh, an epsilon loop. If you yeah. visit an accept state at any time during that loop, then you accept. If the states visited during that loop are all reject states, you reject. If one of those states is an accept state, you accept. If one of those states is, is all of those states are reject states, you reject. I see. So you'd only have to take the loop one time, even though like. There's a bound to the number of computations that will end up occurring after you finish reading the input. All right, let's do another. Um, PDA, let's do one for even length palindromes. Now, if I asked you to write a program that uses a stack to decide this language, what would you do? Um, push what to the stack? Like, as you read the letters, push each letter onto the stack. Okay. And then, but you have to know when midway through the word is. Yeah, how do you know when the middle of the word is? Yeah? 
mean, in programming, you just go through it once, check how long it is, and then go back and do it again. Can't go back in a PDA, though. I would just say, at every point, check if you're at a even like palindrome. Hmm. You can't do that though. There's a there's a there's a there's a better way to say what you said though. Here's what's gonna happen. Uh, let's just be, let's begin with the PDA. First, we need to test if the stack is empty at the end. So we're gonna say read nothing, pop nothing, push the push the canary. Then I'm going to pop. Uh, no, I'm going to read A off the input and push an A and pop nothing. Read a B off the input, push a B and pop nothing. Would you agree that in the self loop, we are going to dump part of the input into the stack? Now, when do we know, when are, when are, we, at the, when are we at the half point, way point to begin reading the stack? Or to begin reading it? Whenever you non-deterministically yeah. guess to be. I'm going to non-deterministically guess the middle. Just guess when I'm at the midpoint. Uh, read an A off the input, pop nothing, wait. Read an A, pop nothing, push A. Read a B, pop nothing, push B. Okay. Read an A off the input, pop an A, push nothing. Read a B off the input, pop a B, push nothing. Then accept when the stack is empty and I'm out of input. Here, this really takes advantage of the non-determinism to guess the middle. Just guess when I'm at the middle and accept. Notice, importantly, that the letters come out in the reverse order that you push them in, right? <coughs> what you're going to do at some point, you, maybe you'll see the C, and then you'll be like CBA, right? Because you pushed A, then you pushed B, then you pushed C. So then when you read the string out of the stack, it's going to come out in the reverse order. You're going to read a C, match it to the C, read a B, match it to the B, read an A, match it to the A, right? Um, what's something else I was going to say? Consider all computations of this PDA on almost palindromes, or like somehow an incorrect guess. Consider the, a string that's almost a palindrome, WWR, but then there's an extra A. So it's like an odd length. And suppose the non-determinism does guess the midpoint right there, right? So you, what you would do is push w, epsilon transition, pop wr, and then you would be at this state with a, an empty stack. So then you would take this transition, pop that off the stack, but you'd still have one a in the input left to read. So then you would implicitly reject. Same reason that if any, any incorrect guess that's not the midpoint will implicitly reject. So this does is a PDA for wwr. Right? You can use a stack to decide if something's a palindrome or not. Questions on this one? OK, let's do a PDA for the, uh, the Dick language. Recall the context-free grammar for this was like s goes to open as close, or ss, or epsilon. And an interesting thing about the Dick language is all these properties and connections it has to even like the Catalan numbers. You can think of uh, a string over a parent parentheticalization as a kind of path through a triangular lattice. So consider these three triangular lattices. Um, consider the paths from this corner to this corner that you can, you can only go up uh, and right or down and right. So here's an example of a path. Right? Something like that. You could do, that's another path. You could also do like, uh, da, da. Uh, da, da, something like that. Those are all paths that go from one corner to the other. But if you think, if you notice, these are actually all strings over the Dick language of a certain length. This corresponds to open, 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 close, close, close. This open, close, open, close, open, close. And this is open, open, close, close, open, close, right? It has exactly the, the, the exact number of paths this way are the st strings in the Dick language of length n. Um, of course, n must be even. But we can actually use this and generalize a way for us to uh, create a PDA for the Dick language. So if I asked you to create a PDA, uh, an algorithm that involved a stack 
for determining if a string was a correct parentheticalization or not, what would you do? Like, push something for every open parentheses, and then make sure that you don't um, make sure that you don't do like a an open make sure you don't I guess make sure you don't close make sure you don't do an open this is why this is such a great problem in data structures. It's because people think I'm going to do like a plus b minus c. I'm going to quickly count the number of parentheticalization. I'm going to count the number of parentheses or something, and it might work out. But then you might accidentally accept strings like this, right? So the answer is sort of the consider the the height of this mountains. This is going to be literally a plot of the computation of the stack depth at any moment. What we're going to do is use, a, use pretend the stack is a single integer, not even integer, a natural number, and, and increment the counter every time we see an open, and decrement the counter every time we see a close. And if that counter is always positive and during, at the end of the computation is zero, then that is the uh, ex, that is an accepted string. Read nothing, pop nothing, push canary. If I see an open, pop nothing, push an A. And I'm using an A just to make it clearer. It doesn't actually matter what we push to the stack, because we don't actually need to keep track of what's in the stack. We just need to keep track of the stack, stack depth. Now, if I see a close, pop an A. And accept any time the stack is empty. That's it. Would you believe me if I told you that's it? This is literally the stack depth, right? You're going to go push A, push A, push A, pop A, pop A, pop A, push A, pop A, push A, pop A, push A, pop A, push A, push A, pop A, pop A, push A, pop A, right? And so on. So this actually is just using the stack as a single integer variable that we can just increment and decrement. If you have a variable you can't divide and multiply by, but you can just say a plus plus, a minus minus, that's basically what a PDA can do as well. PDA can do those abilities. Any questions on that specific uh, PDA? All right, let's do a slightly harder example. This one has a few cases into it. Uh, let's consider basically a generalization of the Dick language. Uh, w is in sigma star. And the number of A's in W is equal to the number of B's in W. Right? This, we just want to make sure the number of A's equals the number of B's. If I asked you to write a stack algorithm for this, what would you do? Like high level programming intuition. What would we, how would we write a, a program for this one? Certainly, if you had two stacks, you could do it. You could just increment, like you would just plus plus for A, plus plus for B, and just check those two numbers are the equivalent, but you can't do that here. Yeah. So if the stack is empty, whatever your first character is, you push that to the stack. Okay. So you reach the next character, and then you start popping. And if your stack is empty, you repeat that with your new second character. And you repeat this until you're finished reading. That way, you're just sort of going back and forth between which character is going into the stack and which character is popping from the stack. So when do you accept? Uh, when you finished reading and the stack is empty. OK. So when do you, what do you push to the stack? Let's say the top of the stack. Uh, so if you see a symbol, you push it to the top of the stack. If the stack is empty, whatever symbol you see, you push that to the top of the stack. What if the top of the stack is an A? 
then if you see an A, you push it to the stack. If you see a B, you pop the A from the stack. Yeah. You're going to use the stack not as a counter, but as a sign counter. So what that means is there's no, if you could do a variable, <laughs> imagine you had a variable that was assigned number. It could be positive and negative. Every time you see an A, you go plus plus. Every time you see a B, you go minus minus. Now, because it's signed, that would allow you to correctly decide B to the N, A to the N. Notice that if it's stack in the, in the, in the dick language one, if, the, if you ever go quote unquote negative, you just implicitly reject. Here, we don't want to implicitly reject. We just want to ensure that at the end, we're, st we're still in equilibrium. We're still zero. So B to the N, A to the N, the plot of that would look like this. A to the n, b to the n would be like this, right? So you just want to accept only if the stack is empty, but you want to use whether or not the stack contains a's or b's as a counter of the surplus. That is something that is a computation. This would be like, that would be like a, 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 b, 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 a, 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 b, 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 A, A, B, something like this, right? It would be basically like that. Um, let's do the PDA for this. It's a little complicated, though, but it's basically exactly what you said. Read nothing off the input, pop nothing, push the canary. We're actually going to only need one state, it turns out. Well, kind of. Uh, read nothing off the input, pop nothing, no, push the, uh, pop the canary and push nothing, okay? Except here. Um, by the way, real quick, on the WWR PDA, uh, the empty string is a palindrome. We agree? Does this PDA accept the, this PDA does not have the start state accepting, but it still accepts the it still accepts the empty string. Why? There is an epsilon transition path to the accept state. Yeah. The computation though is not of zero. It, pushes the canary, epsilon transitions, pops the canary, it accepts the empty string. So here, we'll also accept the empty string, uh, because the empty string has zero a's and zero b's. Now, if we see, um, if the top of the stack, how should I write this? If the top of the stack uh, if we read an A and the top of the stack is a dollar sign, we're going to push the dollar sign back. But then we're going to read nothing and pop nothing and push an additional A. Okay? Peek, the, if the stack is empty, we're going to peek at it and then push the A, the A where we were supposed to. We can't push more than one symbol at once, as we've defined it. But basically, this is, if the stack is empty, this is going to push the A that we see. Okay? Similarly, if we see a B. We see a B and the stack is empty. Push a B. Now, what if uh, there, there's an A on the top of the stack and you see an A in the input? There's the push two A's. Yeah. So what I'll what write, write this, if you see an A on the top of the stack and there's an A in the input, you leave that A alone, you push it right back, and then you push an additional A. And here, if there's a B in the top of the stack and a B in the input, you push that B back and then you push a second B. Now, what if there's an A on the top of the stack and you see a B in the input? What do you do? What should you push? Essentially, every time the, the, what's currently on the stack is considered the surplus that you have. If the stack is BBB, that means you've currently, you're currently three away from equilibrium in the direction of B. Like positive and negative doesn't matter. You're, you have three additional Bs at that moment in computation. So you hope in the future you'll see overcome that by having three additional As. But if you see an A in the input, You'll cancel that out with the B, and you'll keep going, right? But unfortunately, if you keep reading Bs in the input, you'll have to keep pushing Bs. So notice the stack 
at any moment will not contain A and B simultaneously. It'll only contain B's in the canary or A's in the canary. So it's kind of like a stack. It's literally the height of the stack is the, the positive negative part is just is it A in the stack or is B in the stack. And the height of the stack is the, is the magnitude, so to speak. So this is a PDA for uh, uh, W and sigma star, number of A's equal to the number of B's. Any questions on this one? I have one more example. And this is going to be um, a to the i, b to the j, c to the k, uh, i equals j or j is equal to k. Now, i equals j or j equals k, inclusive or, what is an algorithm for this using a stack? Like again, we take, on our, we take our formal idea of like, in our informal idea, like how would I write this as a program, and then try to express that using the syntax of a PDA. So what's an idea to use a PDA for this one? I was thinking we could split it into two okay. uh, PDAs, one that just checks if i is equal to j, and one that just checks if j is equal to k, Okay. using the a to the n, b to the n PDA we used earlier, something similar to that. Perfect. So what we're going to do, here's another way to uh, say that. Push a's on non-deterministically, ministicly guess to match B's or C's. So push the canary, epsilon, pop nothing, push the canary. Push the A's. If we read an A in the input, pop nothing, push an A. Now what we want to do is uh, epsilon transition, epsilon, 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 epsilon. Right? Something like this. Maybe I could write that a little better. Um, now we want we have two branches. Both of them are epsilon transitioned out. We want to non-deterministically choose to match the A's or match the B's. So what we can do, let's say this top branch matches the B's. So what we'll do is just guess the B's. We'll say B. If we read a B in the input and an A in the top of the stack, we'll pop it. And then we'll accept when the stack is empty, right? Epsilon, uh, pop the canary, push epsilon. Now, unfortunately, we still need to read some Cs. So what we're going to do is just uh, dump the Cs, but make sure that we stay on this accept state. C, epsilon, epsilon. Do you agree? Uh, bottom one, let's say we need to skip the Bs. And pop, and pop the C's. So what we're going to do is pop <coughs> a bunch of B's off, uh, read a B, do nothing to the stack. Then we're just going to epsilon transition to begin uh, popping the C's, which is going to be read a C on the input, pop an A on the stack, push nothing. And then from there, we'll accept if the stack is empty. Double check that for me. Let's make sure there's no mistakes. Could you have done this simpler, perhaps? This is for i equals j, i equals k, not j. Oh. Yeah, that's what I meant, though. My bad. <laughs> My bad. We want to match the a's to the b's or the a's to the c's. Not the a's to the b's or the b's to the c's. Yes. a's to the b's or a's to the c's. Yes. Questions on this one? This is an interesting language because, you know, First off, we did sort of the same trick that we did with NFAs to prove that the regular languages are closed under union. We kind of did that here. We took two languages and we kind of union them together with this or here. So we'll talk about the relationship between NFAs and PDAs in, after the break. A second thing to note is this is an, another reason this is an interesting language is it cannot be done 
with a deterministic PDA. This is one that has to be done non-deterministically. It turns out if you could do this with a deterministic P, uh, PDA, then D PDAs would equal PDAs. You can imagine that it, D PDAs are closed under complement. PDAs are n perhaps not. So the complement of this would also be a non-regular, uh, non-context-free language, which we'll, which we'll talk about again on Tuesday. So interesting language that can't be done deterministically. Any more questions on PDAs? We'll talk about the relationship with context-free grammars uh, in a minute. Uh, yeah. Could this do a WWW as in sigma star? Like no. We'll talk about that later. WWR can be done by PDA. How would you do WW? The, the PDA stack is ephemeral because once you pop it out of the stack, it's gone. You can remember things from often ago, but only one time. As soon as you pop it out of the stack, it's gone. You can't ever look at it ever again. Um, yeah, so you, how would you do WW? Unfortunately, it comes out of the stack in reverse. You can't compute on the stack. You can only read off the top of the stack. So we'll see later that WW is, in fact, not a context-free language. So it's, in some sense, harder, even though we, it's a canonical non-regular language, like A to the N, B to the N, WWR. WW has the unique property that it's not even context-free. There is no context-free grammar to generate WW or PDA. So. More questions?